we first met 14 years ago, John, you talked to me about your disillusionment with the Western humanist tradition culminating in the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. You were, you were pleased to have discovered a submerged medieval tradition of mystical thought that offered you a, a new resource. You were so disenchanted, I remember, with the, the carapace of culture that you, you sought to step outside it into nature to, to de-civilize yourself, as, as it yeah, were, but yeah. th that didn't quite solve the problem. You see, I came back from Canada. I, I mean, I came from the bogs, and I became a glutton for culture. Like, I, I ravened through libraries because I was hungry, not because I, I needed, wanted to become an encyclopedia. I was hungry to name myself, to speak myself to myself. And there were myths and symbols and legends and stories that were doing that for me. So I went through libraries seeking, seeking vocabulary, basically. And so after years, I was glutted with culture. And I was seeing everything through the eyes of an Anad or through the eyes of a Raphael, through the eyes of a Phidias or through the eyes of Shakespeare. And I quit. I left in Canada, you know, teaching the history of European ideas, basically. And I came back to the bogs of Connemara. And there was one day when I was lying out there in the bogs of Connemara and uh, I was lying at the edge of a lake and there was a grey crow above me and there was a lap, 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 lap of water blowing onto the rock that I was lying on. And it kind of disturbed me, the grey crow above me, thinking of me as carrion, and the lap, lap, lap of the water. And I was thinking of me and my education. And I got up and I walked across the bogs, and a hair broke away from me. And instantly, I collapsed down onto the bog, and I eased my head down into the hair's forum in the heather. And the, the warmth of the hair was still in it, and the smell of the hair was in it. And I asked that hair's form to heal my European head, to suck all my education out of it, to suck European culture out of my head, because the European head was no longer good for the earth and wasn't good for me. And I wanted it to be a kind of poultice that would suck it all out. And I remember on the way home, I decided I must baptise myself out of Christianity and out of culture. And I actually immersed my head three times in a little stream that was flowing down into Loch Father. And I came back a second time, ten days later, and I immersed myself three times in the stream again. And that day was a fine day, and I was going home, and I called into the shop looking for a few groceries, and one of the girls said, the Lord save us, I mean, <laughs> you're, you're like a drowned rat. <laughs> I mean, is it, has it been wet out there? And I couldn't tell her what I'd been up to. So I was literally baptizing myself out of culture and out of Christianity. In the meantime, I didn't go back to do the third the third session of to complete the baptism, um, my bluff was called. And I see what I was needing, Andy. I was wanting to recreate my mind again from pure sensations, from the color red, from to build up like a build up a mosaic uh, with individual tesserae. The individual tesserae would be the individual sensations, like sensations of hearing, touch, taste, smell, to build up my mind all over again. A new mind is what I wanted. But the new mind would be founded not on concepts, not on myths, not on stories, to be founded on sensations, on things I saw and things I heard. And that's what I wanted, and I passionately wanted, because living in the splendors of Connemara, I mean, uh, you know, that, that I thought was enough. But then, living at a frontier for a long time, I needed... I found one day, my bluff was called, as I was telling you, and I needed help from cultural wisdom. And I was back into culture again. Mm -hmm. But this time, I was looking, for, looking at the mystics. This time, it wasn't the culture that I was teaching in Canada anymore. It was um, the Rhineland mystics and the Spanish mystics. They were the people who were talking to me now. I find that you, your writing is deceptive in the sense that we, the reader, enjoy the fruits of your labour without a lot of pain. I mean, it seems to me that a lot of the work you've done is, is hidden. Well, yeah, I suppose you can't, like, the poetry of Abbey Action, for instance, you can't put it all... I mean, it is reflection. I mean, when words are talked about the poetry, like it is, uh, you remember in tranquility. You have to get to the place of tranquility. I mean, there's the turmoil, there's the tumult, um, there is the upheaval that you go through. And then, while you're in that, you really aren't writing about it in a way that's communicating. Mm. You have to wait for a point where there is a place of calm, 
there's firm, solid ground again. And then you can look back on it, and it is in reflection that you acquire the experience all over again, that you acquire it for the first time. First you live the experience, then you appropriate it, but you appropriate it through myth and through symbol and through concept. And writing is the act of appropriation. Writing is the act, appropriation in tranquility. Now you can walk around the whole experience and you can see it and evaluate it. But while you're in it, um, it is turmoil because you, you can't predict where it's going, you can't see the shape of it yet, um, and it's only after you come through it, it's only after you come through puberty that you see the shape of it after all. Mm. And if you, have, if you have what you call spiritual upheavals in your life, it is only after you've come through them that you can see the shape of it and see that there was maybe a providence in it all. I take it the first reactions you got to, to um, what you were writing about that, that, uh, that kind of voyage was, was crucial. I mean, well, did you get a sympathetic response from people? I was, I was wonderfully lucky. I was put in touch with people who could speak to me, and I ended up in a Carmelite monastery in Oxford. Um, I was picked up at the station and I was told, and I, here in Morehampton Road, I met a man that I went to see, and he said, the man you need to meet is in Oxford. He has been through the fire. And one day I was picked up in the station in Oxford, and I was driven to a house, to a Carmelite house, by a West Cork man. And he had the lovely West Cork accent, so that was lovely. And I crossed the threshold into this Carmelite friary, and three steps down the corridor, his voice dropped and he said, there at supper, very quietly, he said there at supper. And I said to myself, and I knew, I'm home. This is home. I felt I was fished out of the sea because when my world collapsed, crashed in against Darwin's world, when Bishop Usher's sons, which was 4004 BC, crashed. You see, I grew up in that world where the world was a, a play in five acts. There was creation, fall, revelation, redemption, and last things. Now, that was a lovely, tidy play written by God, scripted by God. And I lived in that world, and I knew the traffic rules of that world. Then that world crashed in against Darwin's world. The Bishop Usher's sums crashed in against Darwin's sums of 600 million, 700 million. So I fell out of my world. I fell out of my story. I was man overboard. And when you're man overboard, you're in trouble. And I was man overboard for years. Then I walk back into the Christianity, the Christianity that I thought could no longer speak to me, and here I am now walking back into Christianity. And but I'm walking back into a, a mystical order, a Carmelite order, and I cross the threshold and I say, I'm home. I'm fished out of the sea. And tonight I was at home. And I spent eleven days with the Carmelites. And the Carmelite day that I lived with them was beautiful. The Carmelite day has wisdom in it. The Carmelite day is as beautiful as the art of chalice. The Carmelite day, its rhythm of contemplation and silence and talk, and the rhythm of that day, the shelter that I found in that Carmelite monastery was a wonder to me and still is a wonder to me. I mean, Chartres Cathedral is beautiful. The Carmelite day is just as beautiful. Would it have appealed to you? Did you think about it as a possible yeah. way of life? Yeah, it and... and my longing is to be a Carmelite, but I couldn't be... A, I went back and I lived with them for a year, and then I went lived with them for four months, but as a layman. And, um, and again for four months, and they allowed me to stay because I worked in the garden for them. So that was the quid, quid pro quo there. And the Carmelite day nourished me and sheltered me. I mean, what do we need? Houses don't shelter us. But the Carmelite order did shelter me at a time when I needed shelter. And I just felt that I couldn't be a Carmelite because I wasn't theologically orthodox enough, that I would be, in the long run, probably a disturbance to any contemplative house because I'm a Christian, but I'm not a Christian dogmatically. I'm a Christian... I'm a Christian... Well, I suppose now... I'm, st I'm a Christian with the rosary beads in my pocket, like, yeah. but I wasn't what, then. What, what do you think of organised religion, I mean, from, from where you're coming now? We need shelter. Our houses don't shelter us. They shelter us from some of the elements, but 
deep down in our souls and our minds we have needs and we are exposed inwardly to dangerous places within ourselves we are exposed to longings that are that are like cleopatra that are eternal and immortal longings in us and we need a religion to shelter us in our depths to shelter us in the places where ordinary culture secular culture can't shelter us so religion is about shelter and we need shelter and i need the shelter of myth I need the shelter of religion. I need the shelter of a great house. I mean, when Philip Larkin goes to a church, do you remember, he's walking in somewhere in England and he comes upon a church and he takes off his bicycle tips and he parks his bike against the gable end and he walks in and he goes up to the holy end of the church. He gets the musty smell and he reads a bit from the, op- from the, from the open book uh, that is there in the lectern and his words echo around the house and he thinks, what in God's name are we going to do with these churches? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, will we rent them out rent-free? Will we let them out rent-free to sheep and rain? Or will we keep one of them and keep it permanently in show? And so he's walking in at the end of a Christian tradition. But then Mm. there's that last wonderful stanza, a serious house on serious earth that is, in whose Mm. blent air all our compulsions beat, are recognized and robed as destinies, and that much never can be obsolete. For someone will be surprising a hunger in himself to be more serious and gravitating with it towards this ground which he had once was proper to grow wise in, if only so many dead lie round. Now, he's naming it here, like, it is a serious house on serious earth. I mean, where the central bank is built, that isn't a the central bank, isn't a serious house, and it has made the earth that it's sitting on unserious. We will always need a serious house on serious earth, because in our depths, however much we cooperate with the silliness of the modern world, or with any world, however... There is huge, serious life in us. And when life in you is serious, you need a serious house. Was this what lies behind your, your concern to to, um, to plant the, the, the ground plans of a temple? Yeah, because modern humanity, as you know from Eliot's wasteland, like is destitute humanity. We are living in a wasteland. I mean, there was once, and they, when I moved house in Connemara, that house you were in, I moved to the mm. next cottage down uh-huh. the, the, beside it. And I was in it already for six weeks, and one day I opened a cupboard. And there, Joe Mullery, is, Joe Mullery was the person who had been in the cottage the last, and he had left spuds in a shelf of the cupboard. Now, this was spring, and those spuds had desperately sprouted. They were white and gaunt and shriveled, and they were on a shelf, and they were reaching for the sun, but there was no soil around them, and they were totally cut off from the sun. Now, modern humanity, we are a little bit like those buds in that cupboard. We are cut off from soil and sun. And so we do need to be inhumed again, a kind of inhumation to get in touch with soil in in, in, the, in the best sense of that which nourishes us. I don't mean soil in the sense of that which a chemist might analyse, but that deep place within ourselves that nourishes us and that is fairly frightening. We need to come out from the cupboard to be taken out and put back into the wild earth, to be put back into the rich earth, and to, to, to not be sealed off from sun and soil. So, yeah, I feel that what we need now is a serious house on serious earth. So there was once... When I went to the centre of Ireland, I went walk about to the centre of Ireland with a ground plan of a new sacred building. And I planted it, having gone down into the root of a monastic island first. I went to St. Kieran's cell in Clonmacnoise, that small little cell. So I went into the shell. That is like a little shell that was washed up on a seashore. When you told me this, uh, when you spoke about this to me, not 14 years ago, but maybe 10 years ago, I said to myself, he's, 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 he wants to found a new religion. No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, Christ founded the religion that I'm happy to be a member of. All I would be doing there was crying out that we live in a destitute time, God. Um, We can't any longer perceive that um, we are maybe sheltered. We need shelter all over again. But it is within an already established religion that I seek shelter. It is to let Christianity flower in a way, to flower mystically um, again and to acknowledge the mystical tradition within Christianity, to bring the the Rhineland mystics and the Spanish mystics to the heart of the Christian tradition. You see, there is a new gospel. There's a fifth gospel out there. And the best way way to talk about, about what happened to Jesus is in the mystics. 
I mean, the, the, the great passion narratives of the sermons of Eckhart and the works of St. John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, Julian of Norwich, these are a tremendous heritage. Could we bring that mystical tradition to the heart of Christianity? Because if a religion isn't mystical, it is, I think, you know, it can very easily become a set of formalities, you know. So what I was trying to do there... And, what I, it was and yet, I take your point, of course, and yet presumably the justification for the organised system we know it is to keep the show on the road, to have some kind of framework or shell yeah, there yeah, that yeah, can be yeah. filled out by the kind of insights that you're Yeah, but you're I'm bringing. acknowledging yes. the need yes. for a shell. I'm acknowledging the need. I mean, after all, when I walked that night into the Christian, the cross the Christ, Christian threshold into the Carmelite order, I was walking into an order. I was walking into the Carmelite day. I was walking into an organized religion. And I needed the organized religion. We, I, 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 I won't talk for other people. I need an organized religion. When you evaluate literature, do you read much contemporary work, by the way, at all, either I philosophy mean, or novels? Or uh, yeah, I'm, t- yeah, I'm tangentially in touch with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what are you primarily concerned with when, when you look at uh, material today? What are you looking for? Well, I mean, I would look for, I mean, the typical modern novel, like, you know, thinks... Do you remember the famous story that's in Bede, mm-hmm. where he talks about, about um, the king of Northumbria being converted to Christianity, and his counsellors are all around him there? And he, his counsellors say, one of his counsellors says to him, our life is like, this th- imagine this hall, this great hall that we're living in. It has a gable end doorway there and a gable end doorway there. A bud flies in through that gable, that gable end window, flies through the hall, flies out through the other gable end window. Now, Christianity tells us, uh, claims to know about what is beyond the gable of conception and beyond the gable of death. Now, the modern novel thinks that all of life happens within the gables. <laughs> it te- typically tends. It is not aware of what is beyond the gable. Now, this is where Christianity and re- any religion will come in. It knows that the map we are dealing with is bigger than, than what is, exists between the gables, than w- the interior within the gables. There, there is a beyond conception and there is a beyond death. There is a beyond the gable of conception and a beyond the gable of death. And we have to take that into account in any estimation of who and what we are. The typical modern novel and the typical modern poem is, is working off a very incomplete map. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is sociology. So, I mean, it is what Simon Weil would call swamped in the crowd. It is, it is still lost in, 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 a, in a platonic cave. Exceptions, I suppose, people like Geoffrey Hill. And, and Geoffrey Hill, I mean, his wonderful poem, Genesis, Geoffrey Hill, there are. I mean, Ted Hughes is coming around to it. Ted Hughes is already, is, is already there. But I'm t- like, your typical beach novel or airport novel isn't aware of what's beyond the gables. Mm. Now, what's, what's within the gables is, isn't, is only part of the story. So any complete account of what we humanly are must take account of what we were beyond the gable of conception and what we will be, again, beyond yeah. the gable of death. Death is a way through that, uh, as you say. Do, is it, it, does death... Um, where is it in your scheme of things? Well, there's an, a Native American Indian has said, there is no death, there's only a change of worlds. I think I believe that, that death is a portal, is a doorway. For all the humiliations of dying that people go through in cancer wards and in surgery and the terrible humiliation that people go through, I think the moment of de- death is, in fact, a moment of new possibility and a moment of release. And it is a change of worlds. There is no death in the sense of a final end. There is only a change of worlds. And I need to prepare myself for that other world and how I will stand in other, that world and how I will survive the light that will shine on me when I arrive in that world because I will have shaken off the impediments of mortality then and the new light is going to shine on me and how will I stand in that new light? Will I be able to say I am worthy in that new light? Because I'm now in a new landscape, in a new place. Like, mm-hmm. And I, prayer is a way of enabling me to deal with that new place prayer crosses that boundary the only thing i mean you can't send a spaceship across the, that boundary mm-hmm. we think we're wonderful because we send a spaceship to mars the, the great boundary is the boundary between between death between life and death now prayer is what crosses that boundary your, your christianity your understanding of it as you say heavily influenced by, by the mystical tradition is, is very much um has a religious focus morality doesn't appear much in it i mean do, do you Good and God, Andy. Yeah. I mean, it's everywhere in it. Because, but I believe, what I believe, Andy, is that in some way vision has to pre- precede morality, that the Prius is vision. 
you have a vision of life, you have a vision of the earth. I mean, I say, after all, that the earth is Bud Gaia and the universe is a mantraverse. Now, when you, when you, when you talk like that, if the earth is Bud Gaia, if the earth is already an enlightenment earth, if it is already a holy place, and if you, if you talk about the earth as sacred and holy and the great and sacred earth, then you can't take a chainsaw to it the way you naturally take it, chainsaw to it. First, you have to, you have to, we have to open our eyes to the glory of what surrounds us. And if we can open... This, I'm, I'm in agreement. I'm, all I'm saying is that very often what we're getting... Um, is, is the morality, would that the kind of undertow you're talking about? Yeah, I think yeah. morality has to be, will grow and evolve from vision, from a vision of how things are, from a vision of the splendor. I mean, you know, splendor veritatis, the splendor, I mean, it's a great word, the, splen- the many splendor thing, the splendor of, 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 of what we see and what we hear, and the terror of, of what we hear and what we see, and the frightfulness of what we hear and what we see. Like, there's Job also going out on safari, going on safari into his psyche and seeing terror and seeing frightful stuff. Every night we have nightmares, as some of us have nightmares, like, and we're, we're in touch with something that's terrible. But the terrible is also salvific. The terrible can, can be salvific. And if we eliminate terror totally from the universe, we'll die. You had a... Um in the last year, was it uh, a television series um, which was very well received? Um, what, what did you learn from that? I was very just. I had old people and young people on in the last two programs, or we had. Or, or, or the, the second last program was young people, and the last program was older people. And I wanted to hear from the young people that they could hear the radical question. I was sixty years. I'm sixty years of age now, and without pretending anything. I was the radical person on that programme. It should be the other way around. I should be the old doddery conservative, and they should have been the radicals asking the radical question. They were totally lost, I thought, within the global economy. They weren't asking the the, the big questions anymore. Um, But, I mean, let me be kind to them. I mean, there's a stage in your life when you're interested in your career. Who will I marry? Uh, what house will I live in, where will I live in, these are the big questions. When you come to your 40s, then you ask other questions when you've, you know, you've answered those. And, but the, oh, there were elders then in the last programme, and they were a wonder. They existed in the r- total richness of the world. I mean, they were away in the fairies, like, but they were also in touch with, 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 with rock and stone and tree. Like, the world to them was infinitely rich, full of all kinds of dimensions that Einstein would, that would embarrass Einstein, like. And it was so wonderful, you know, to be listening to those old people. And they were beyond left and right in politics. They were beyond radical and conservative. They were in a wonderful, gracious, splendid place. And only the greatest of morality could emerge from... They were visionaries. They were visionaries. I had three or four visionaries from the mountains on the final programme. And it, talking about spirit foxes, you know, and talking about borders and talking about um, thresholds. I mean, they were wonderful. This is the blackbird and the bell. Yeah, the, the last programme. Yeah, yeah. program, but young you were more disappointed in the younger folk, yeah. I was despondent. I went away despondent because I haven't had anything from young people now in universities. I haven't had... There's no rebellions. Um, I don't hear them asking any questions about, um, about where we're going or where we're coming from. Maybe they are, but I don't hear them. I mean, they are, they, when they take to the streets, they take to the streets about, um, about more money and more grants. But, I mean, I don't hear... That night I proposed to them, we are now AIDS virus to the earth. We, the human species, we are doing to the earth what the AIDS virus does to the human body. We're breaking down its immune system. Are ye worried? I said that the earth has voyaged for 4,600 million years. It has now crashed into an iceberg in the way that the Titanic crashed into an iceberg. It has crashed into an iceberg. The iceberg the voyaging earth has crashed into is humanity. Now, it might not survive its crash with humanity, this earth. Are ye worried? Like, they weren't asking that kind of question. And when it was presented to them, but they were wonderful, bright people. And she said, I, "Like I don't want to run down these. They were wonderful, bright people. They hadn't arrived at the stage. Like, if the Earth doesn't, sh- they are the generation. If the Earth doesn't turn on them, if human history doesn't turn on this next generation, if they end up imitating us, then it's all over. 
the change has to occur in the next generation. The major turnaround, the major metanoia has to happen in the next generation. The next generation cannot afford yet another generation doing to it what we have done to it. When we last spoke, you were in Galway. You moved to, to Kerry. Why, why did you move? Ran out of options in Connemara. Oh. Um, a pub opened beside my house, and then I got a new, a new site, and a quarry opened beside that, and uh, I couldn't compete with barristers from Dublin in relation to buying a site, so I thought I'd look for a house in some Irgulta place, some backward place in Kerry. So I found a place under the foot of Mangleton Mountain, and I went home. Not because I wanted to leave Connemara. I would have happily lived for the rest of my life in Connemara. But I found a place in Kerry. I was going down to give a talk, so I said I'd look for a site, and I got a site in Kerry. So I have a, little, I have a house now below, under the mountain, down from the Horses Glen. So I'm still in the mountains, and that's wonderful. Back home to home to Kerry. Yeah. Of course, where, where you were born. In, in, yeah, yeah, in, in, yeah, 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 yeah. That was tar- was a tarbo to my I was, I was my born in North Kerry, but yeah. and I grew up in North Kerry, but now I'm back in um, five miles inside Killarney under Mangleton Mountain, and it is wonderful. I'm down from the Horses Glen, which is a great quarry up the, up, up above me, and there's a comer there, a great a ravine there, and it drains the water of three lakes, which is up in the Coombe, and I can hear the roar of that in the night, and. Um, I can see the mist veiling and unveiling Talk Mountain and some mornings I sit inside in my room and it's like being present at the first morning of the world because the world is emerging from the wonderful mist, the Ciodriochta that moves upon the mountains and it's all blessedness. And there are days, Andy, when our geological talk and our psychological talk and our theological talk and our mythological talk or the talk that we've ever talked comes home to you and you're silent because you know that words can't name what it is you're seeing. And if we only had the courage of what it is we're seeing and the splendor of what's out there, then we would change, then we would stand in a new way on the earth. John Moriarty, thank you very much indeed. Mm-hmm.